Appeal Utah is taking a different approach to their annual legislative recap. They're hosting it at Wise Guys Comedy Club and featuring comedian scientist Kasha Patel. Get informed about everything the legislature did to impact our environment, find out what's next, and then have a good laugh. Stand Up and Heal, A Cure for Legislative Hangover is Thursday, May 11th at Wise Guys Comedy Club. It starts at 6 p.m. Tickets are 25 bucks and it's 21 and up. Details at HealUtah.org. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. By now, you've probably seen the video of two Draper homes sliding off a cliff and collapsing into a ravine. It is absolutely shocking. And what we all want to know now is who's to blame. It's Thursday, May 4th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Salt Lake Tribune columnist Robert Gerke, you and I and the rest of the world watched as two homes slid down a hillside in Draper last week. As I understand it, you've got three major entities in the mix here. The state legislature, the city of Draper, and the builder, Edge Homes. So the question that everyone is trying to figure out right now, and I'm going to try and make you answer it, (laughs) is who's to blame? Who's to blame? (laughs) Well, that's a nice try, Ali. But (laughs) I think there's probably some blame to go around. Um, it's, It's a little bit early to say, I think, you know, whether or corners cut or anything like that. You know, the builder says that the that the retaining wall that failed was uh, engineered by professional engineers and mm. built to their specifications, and and it, and it just didn't hold. The city is saying, well, we had concerns about this from day one when they came to us. There, there are homes that are built in that area. They say that um, they had serious concerns about. But then we get to the the Utah legislature which has kind of tied the city's hands in trying to in in responding to some of this stuff. So there's probably a little bit of blame to go around, but I think we also have to kind of wait and see after they get in there, get it cleaned up and find out about what exactly failed uh, before we start assigning blame. Sorry. Hmm. Sorry. I don't have a better answer for you. That's so un-American of you. (laughs) Well, let's talk a little bit about the legislature piece of this because Mm -hmm. A common theme that comes up on this show where we are consistently talking about city issues is how often the Utah legislature makes a habit of chipping away at a city's own oversight. And you wrote a piece for the Salt Lake Tribune about how the situation is kind of no exception. So can you pull that apart for us a bit? Yeah. So I think we start from the vantage point of the the Utah legislature is dominated by uh, developers. Um, you've got the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, the Majority Leader of the House. So many members in the body are either real estate developers or real est- have interest in real estate. So yeah. the, it, our laws are very, very favorable to real estate interests and to developers in particular. And so it, it limits what cities can do. I didn't realize to quite the extent of it, but I started reading court rulings, property ombudsman reports, and and they always seem to come down in on the side of the developers because the, the legislature has given these developers a vested right to develop their property. And so unless the city can really present a compelling, overwhelming case uh, that, that it shouldn't be developed, um, they are kind of constrained in what they're able to do. And the mayor of Draper pointed to... Uh, previous instances where they've expressed concerns about some development plans and they got sued over it and lost. And they were told, well, either either you A, have to buy out the property, pay the developer for what they're losing, or B, you have to let them go. And so in this instance with these particular developers in this particular area, they got the engineering report, they jumped through the hoops they were supposed to jump through. And so the city's hands are kind of tied in in many respects and in terms of how hard they're able to push back. They don't have the leverage when they get to the negotiating table with the developers because the developers can only say, well, you know, state law says this, uh, you either have to approve it or you have to pay us. And so they they go ahead and approve it. Well, I couldn't help but notice in on Twitter that Representative Jeff Stenquist, who is Draper's representative in the Utah House, responded to these sort of surfacing uh, allegations that the legislature is not blameless or not completely uninvolved in this whole scenario. Mm -hmm. And what he wrote was this, which I think is so interesting. 
Ultimately, home builders are responsible and should be held accountable for engineering and construction. It is not the role of governments to do the engineering, but to ensure that the engineering work has been completed. What do you make of this response? Yeah. I mean, this is his district. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and the city does have uh, uh, engineering firms on contract to review some of these proposals because, you know, when these developers come with these engineering reports, the city doesn't necessarily have the expertise to do it. So they contract with people and, and they're just making sure that the boxes are checked. The standard is essentially that if it's done, if it looks credible, if it's based on reliable information, they're not really reviewing it for, to see if they agree with it. They're just reviewing it to see if it's done, kind of like Representative Stenquist was saying there. So if cities are basically just rubber stamps, I think it's actually, as I put in my column, kind of detrimental because not only uh, does it give the public a false sense of security, you know, that they're living in places where it's safe to be living. It also takes pressure off the home builder if things go wrong. I mean, in this particular case with these two homes that slid, slid down the hillside, the people had been ordered to vacate the premises back in October, well before we had this wild winter that we've been having. Um, and the ground had been giving way right underneath these homes for months. And so it's a real, I mean, it's heartbreaking to see, but hopefully when all is, when all is said and done that we kind of take a step back and say, okay, do we really want cities to be neutered to the extent that they are? Or do we want them to be able to stand up for, for homeowners? The other thing that really bothers me about it is there's not really clear direction on what builders have to disclose to the, to the buyers. Um, and I, I've seen language from the contracts that Edge Homes was using, and it says basically soil can shift, you've been warned. Uh, and and so you kind of waive your ability to take us to court for, for negligence or damages. And so the deck is incredibly stacked, not just against the cities, but I think more importantly against the people who are buying the homes. Yeah. Well, I guess that begs the question, like, in October, when the city issued the notice requiring residents to evacuate these two homes that ultimately collapsed, what did the home builder Edge Homes have to say? Well, they, they pushed back on it initially. They were saying that they didn't think it needed to be done, that they thought they could stabilize uh, the, the ground where they that was slipping away. And uh, over the next couple months, they said that it, it became clear that the city made the right call, that they needed to be um, evacuated. But this is kind of goes back to the, the, the larger issue. I mean, this whole area has a history of landslides. And I talked to this professor from up at the University of Utah who studied the area in 2010. It was actually really fascinating because she moved to Utah in 2005 and was looking for a place to live. Her husband worked in Lehigh. They thought this would be a perfect place. And she went up there and just saw it visually from a distance. It's like, no, we're not living here <laughs> because because. The Utah Geological Survey has documented numerous landslides in the area. And when ground starts sliding, it doesn't just slide a little. It continues to slide over time. And then you've got these two particular homes that were built on this incredibly steep slope. And and the builder thought, well, okay, if we put fill dirt in here and put a retaining wall in, it's going to keep it from sliding down there. But it's a drainage, too. I mean, this is where water is historically has flowed. And so if you have water flowing over time through an area where there's a steep slope. I mean, I, I, look, I'm not a scientist, but it doesn't take a scientist, I don't think, to, to discern that that's not a great place to put a couple million dollar homes. What I don't understand is if a geologist walked up to the site, took one look at it and said, nope, then... Yeah. Why and how are home builders building there? It wasn't this particular site, to be clear. It's the Traverse right. Mountain area. Okay. And then she went back and studied it. Utah Geological Survey had done all these reports that said it has really weak bedrock and really loose, crumbly soil on top of that. Part of it is that we're kind of limited in places we can build. And, and it's not just in Traverse Mountain. I was looking at some Utah Geological Survey maps this morning. And there are areas all along the foothills up and down the, the Wasatch Mountains that are prone to sliding. It's just sort of a, a natural thing. Um, we've seen slides in Layton recently, you know, up in, in, in Davis County. Uh, some pretty significant home losses there down in, I, I believe in Provo, there, was, there were some recent ones. So it's not limited to this area. I mean, they can build there, I think, because uh, we're kind of running out of 
good land. And this is, to be honest, great. It has great views. Um, it's undeveloped. These the home prices there have gone through the roof. A lot of people are clamoring to move in there. And so I think with a, a lot of money to be made, and, and if you can get the right engineering report like they were able to do, they're going to go ahead and make it happen. Yeah, we want to believe. Well, I mean, you brought up basically the fact that Salt Lake County is in a housing crisis. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know what the homeowners are getting out of this. I mean, are they just expected to cut their losses, these families that own these two homes? Well, I mean, I think that kind of remains to be seen. There's been reporting uh, uh, that one of the owners of one of the homes has been going back and forth with Edge Homes for months trying to get this taken care of. There are legal limitations on the liability of the builders who build in these areas. There was a Supreme Court case not long ago uh, that actually involved the same engineering company. There was a collapse that uh, they said, well, the engineering report was substandard, was faulty, and so they should be liable. And And the court said, no, they can't be liable beyond the terms of the contract. And like I said, the contract can be very constraining in, in what sort of recourse these homeowners have. And so I think we're going to have to watch it play out. But again, just like the deck is stacked in the developer's favor when it comes to getting permits to build the homes, I think the deck is stacked in their favor when it comes to being held accountable for the, the failures of homes like we've seen in this instance. Really, really reassuring, isn't it, Allie? It's extremely disheartening. And I know, like, I mean, watching this video, reading your story, learning more about this situation, there's a piece of me that kind of thinks that these homeowners were scammed. Like, this kind of feels like a, it has sort of the DNA of a scam. We've heard the term a lot, buyer beware, right? But you can only beware to a certain point. You're not supposed to be a geologist. You're not You're not expected to know if you're in a floodplain or not. And, and yeah, maybe, maybe it's a good wake-up call that we all need to be a little bit more uh, aware of these issues that could arise. But at the same time, there's there's got to be some responsibility, I think, on the developers and at least some disclosure, at least some transparency so people know what they're getting when they put their name on the contract of the biggest purchases most of us are ever going to make in our entire lives. Yeah. I mean, if I drove a car off a lot and it started coming apart before I took a first turn, like... Mm -hmm. The legislature would be ready to go to war with the car manufacturer. But. Yeah. And to be clear, this was a known slide area and continues to be a known slide area. And and, yeah. and the professor I talked with, Kathleen Nicole, from up at the U uh, University of Utah, said that she she takes her classes up there every year and it, because it's a demonstration of an area that is is sort of prone to landslides. And she said every time she goes up there, she sees more roads that are buckling, foundations that are slipping, and a lot more houses that are being built. Uh, it doesn't seem to slow the demand for homes in this area. What would it take for the legislature to step up and shift the cards more towards in cities and, and buyers' <laughs> favor? I mean, is this, this video has gone basically globally viral. Yeah. Is that enough? Yeah, I mean, I think it would take a small miracle or one of their own homes maybe sliding down a hillside. I, yeah. I'm not really optimistic that they're going to take this seriously or reassess or reevaluate the balance uh, that we have. I do think that at the very least, some some clear requirements for disclosure should be should be included in this. If this is an area where no, there is a known history of landslides, then if you or I are buying a house, we should be able to have that disclosed to us. And the information is all there. A lot of this stuff is mapped. A lot of it is documented. But it's just a question of making sure that the buyers at least have that. I got to feel like, you know, there's got to be some accountability when, when things go badly, whether that's to the city. If you're going to hold the city accountable, you need to give them a little bit more power to push back on these. And if, you, if you're not going to do that, then I think the builder's got to be held accountable. If they build in an area where there's a known history of this sort of uh, this sort of activity. Do you think we'll see some accountability in the next few weeks, months here, or do you think this is the kind of thing that ends up in court forever, drags out? I would not be at all surprised if this does end up in court. Kind of goes back to the first question you asked: Who's responsible? Well, everybody's kind of pointing fingers at everybody else, and so I think when you start getting to the point where people are going to have to start writing checks. I think those fingers are going to be pointed even more aggressively in different directions. So I would not be at all surprised if this ends up in court. But again, you know, as I mentioned, 
the recourse that the homeowners in particular have in this instance uh, could be pretty limited. Salt Lake Tribune columnist Robert Gerke, extremely disheartening information here. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm always <laughs> raining on your parade, Allie. I apologize for that, but thank you for having me That's on. That's okay. We're relentless over here. Thanks for your reporting on this, though. It's yeah, really important. I appreciate it. Thank you. Speaking of housing, Salt Lake City just cut the ribbon on a new housing development at 2nd South and State Street. It's called The Aster. Previously, it was an abandoned building, and now it's housing, so you know we love that. Yes, The Aster features 20,000 square feet of commercial space because it is a mixed-use project. But it's also got 168 affordable units, ranging from studios to four bedrooms, 95 of them will be rented at rates affordable to residents earning 20 to 50% of the area median income. In simple terms, that means anyone making anywhere from 20 to $36,000 a year. If you, like me, ever drive around Salt Lake, see other abandoned buildings, and wonder, why isn't this housing? There is an episode of CityCast Salt Lake where we did just that and got some answers from Salt Lake's planning director. I dropped the link in the show notes. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye. Bye.